Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. My name is Raif Darazi, and in this video, I'm excited to interview our special guest, Jeff Galvin, to discuss the latest announcement of AGT's phase one clinical trial findings. Jeff Galvin is the CEO and founder of American Gene Technologies. He earned his BA degree in economics from Harvard in 1981. He has more than 30 years of business and entrepreneurial experience, including founder or executive positions at a variety of Silicon Valley startups. Several of his companies were taken public and or sold to public companies, including one in the medical technology arena that was sold to Varian, the leading maker of linear accelerators used in cancer therapy. Following his startup experience, he retired to become an angel investor in real estate and high tech. He came out of retirement to found and fund AGT after meeting Roscoe Brady at NIH. Mr. Jeff Galvin, so good to see you. How are you? I'm great, Rife. Uh, uh, thanks so much for having me on your program. I still remember our great conversation on the HIV Cure Chronicles, and it's wonderful to see you again. You as well, and thank you so much for making the time to um, to talk with me. I'm, I'm sure, especially after your announcement, that this is an incredibly busy time for you. Yeah, it's always busy. I mean, it's been 15 years of busy, uh, <laughs> but I've been loving it, and um, you know, I feel like very fulfilling journey that's working out well. Not all, you know, interesting journeys actually uh, get you closer and closer to, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, a goal line that you're very excited about. But I, I've had that and yeah, I'm really busy, but I, I also feel like, you know, these conversations are so educational for me and so important that, um, you know, it's worth being even busier. So it's nice of you to say that, but uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, let's, you know, uh, keep me in mind, uh, you know, in the future as well. Absolutely. I'm sure the audience, the viewers will be clamoring to have you back after this. Um, I actually just released a video basically summarizing your announcement um, a little over a week ago now. Already has over sixty thousand views, so wow. I would say there's there's a lot of interest. <laughs> oh, cool! Well, great. I, I'm anxious to tell you more about it. Like you probably have a sense for what people are wondering about, and mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I there's a lot of people that I consider stakeholders in AGT who aren't investors. They're not employees. They're, you know, they're they're stakeholders because our mission can impact them. And I'm very interested in connecting with them and having a very honest and transparent dialogue because, uh, you know, over time, we really hope that that community will help us to, you know, uh, to take this along a very important part of its journey from us proving it out to us getting it to everybody that needs it. And, you know, that is uh, something that requires a lot of public awareness uh, because there's a ton of inertia out there when it comes to uh, HIV treatment. And overcoming that will require uh, that people who, um, you know, uh, feel um, strongly about moving forward in HIV treatment and to a cure um, participate in some way. And the, and the best way to participate is to just be educated on exactly where we are, you know, what, what we intend to do and uh, to stay in touch. So 60,000 views, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and you, and you touched on something really key and that's community. And I, I, I definitely wanna dig into that with you in a little bit. But first I want to um, start with the general, talking about American Gene Technologies. In the About Us section, you mention developing a gene therapy platform. Mm -hmm. And I understand the analogy of Apple's iOS being like the platform and the iPhone um, third party developers building on that. And so I, um, Apple is creating this platform for developers to build their own apps on. And so you're like Apple and hopefully other people who want to create cures will be like 30 third party developers. But practically speaking, can you talk about what what the platform is? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Let me step back a little bit and talk about the, the goal of platforms in software, right? And um, I'll get back to this, but the idea being that if you look at DNA in your body, it behaves a lot like software 
in an organic computer. So the cell is instructed by these ACTGs. It's not zeros and ones, but it's very similar. It's four symbols that, depending on the order of those things, means exact commands to your cell. And it makes exact gene products. And it's very complicated after there because these gene products combine and, and make you, right? But in so much as that we can change you uh, genetically, that we can go in and edit your DNA, we can have a tremendous impact on how your body operates. And we can correct things that are problems. We can uh, improve uh, you know, or give new features to cells. I mean, there's so many things that we can do there. But from the day that I learned about viral vectors from Roscoe Brady, what I um, immediately believed was that this new way of making drugs to improve people's health is much more like software than it is like traditional biotech or pharma. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, traditional biotech and pharma is about discovering something that works in your body, and usually that's randomly discovered or randomly generated and tested, and, you know, one in 50,000 molecules actually makes it into a phase three. And why is that? It's because it's the random nature of it. And, and these drugs go all over your body, and they have effect on every cell in your body. And what you're always looking for is that, you know, that uh, Goldilocks situation where it does something positive but doesn't do something so negative that the drug's useless, right? But when we're talking about changing your DNA, the changes are so specific and we can target them to just the cells that we want to change. We can make viruses that go to the right cells and we can make on-off switches on the drug itself that only turns on in the right place. So what we've done is we've created sort of a deterministic development environment and um, it, it means that we can, we can predict how these things will behave based on what we know about genetics and how your cell works and how your, uh, your system's biology works, how your you know, immune system works, how diseases move around your bodies, all these different things, right? We can predict the behavior of these drugs and we can design things that are likely to work. And if they don't work perfectly, guess what we can do? We can debug them. All right. So this is why I think it's so much like software. But then you say, all right, what's the, next, what's the important thing to do? Well, if you want to make a big contribution to software, what you'd want to do is you'd want to bring efficiency to software development. And how do we do that? We do it with platforms. iOS is a great example, and the iPhone, right? You want to do something that has tremendous value to people, you can write an app on the iPhone and you don't have to reinvent cellular and GPS and bitmap graphics and, you know, all, all that stuff, right? Surface mount technology. I mean, there's all these components that are just, you take for granted, are in your cell phone, right? And, and you write on top of that. And what you're writing is a new creative element that brings out value in the world by leveraging a lot of this, these standard functions that just exist on your behalf, all right. But back up a little bit, there was a, another um, platform called MS-DOS, right? Very rudimentary compared to iOS <laughs> and the iPhone, but still valuable, right? Because it handled a lot of the basic elements that were in every application that every developer wanted to write for a PC. And that is what our platform is all about. What are the things that are common across many different drug applications, right? Well, first of all, getting therapeutic levels of expression, right? So you have to know how to actually put a gene in and get it to express at levels where it makes a difference. That's non-trivial, but we've solved that problem. That's part of our platform. Mm. Then you have to figure out, how do I make it only turn on in the correct cells? Well, that's also part of our platform. We have all sorts of elements that we can just give you where, okay, you don't have to reinvent all that. And then how do you do it safely? Well, we've done, dealt with a whole bunch of safe stuff. Well, that's the three basic legs of the stool. But then we've innovated a lot of things in terms of constructs that have specific value in chronic viral infection, monogenic disease, immuno-oncology. So these are all elements you could pull together and add a little bit of creativity to and make a whole new application that we never even thought about possibly. And, and so we are like MS-DOS for your body now. And we can reduce the cost of somebody developing an app for your body 
by 90%. We can reduce the time by 90%. We can reduce the risk by 99%. What does that mean? Well, gee, at those levels, almost anybody can be a drug developer. We can make a cottage industry out of making new drugs in 10,000 diseases that are likely to become addressable by gene and cell therapy. And by making this platform and allowing anybody to use it for free and only asking for some percentage of their profit on the back end, right? Well, what we'd be doing is we'd be helping to create an explosion of new applications that were done at very low amounts of money, at very low risk. So if they failed, it didn't break the bank. And if they succeeded, they could actually be brought out. And that's the goal of the platform. So this is the purpose of it. You sort of understand some of the common elements that I'm talking about. It's very complicated when you get down to that level, just like the iPhone's really complicated when you get down to that level as well. But you do understand that the app developer doesn't need to know everything that's going on in the iPhone in order to make something that's valuable to you. And our app developers will be able to cure diseases without understanding a lot of the stuff that's under the hood of our platform. And that is not just the, the sort of the mechanics of it or, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the component architecture of it, but it, it gives you an understanding of the purpose of it as well. It's all about creating efficiency in this industry so that we can maximize the benefit for the patient. Wow, that's really incredible. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot to kind of wrap your head around. It, it feels like the evolution, the next natural step of medicine. Um, and it sounds like you're creating standardization processes and procedures so that nobody has to reinvent the wheel. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, the possibilities kind of are, are endless at that point. That's what I believe. And, and I think that it was intuitive to me coming out of the computer and software industry that this is what I was seeing. But I don't think it was intuitive to people that have been in pharmaceuticals for years because it did, wasn't consistent with the normal models of creating value in that industry. And so I think we have actually innovated the, the idea of a pharmaceutical model. And I don't think it's popular right now because if you look at most of the money out there, it's being made in drugs that were developed in the old way of doing things. But the new way of doing things is a natural disruption to the old way of doing things. It's sort of like, you know, if you were still using vacuum tubes in computers instead of using integrated circuits, right? <laughs> when something comes along, it can actually change the entire business model, development model, and, and especially the range of possibilities of what we can do, right? So this disruption that I think will happen in pharmaceuticals to the benefit of everybody on earth is that a new technology is now becoming practical that completely changes the economics and the whole process of bringing out new things for the patient. And it is very similar to the, when the PC disrupted the uh, mainframe computer market, right? Um, that the... Um, it took a little while for the public and the industry to recognize how the industry was, how the entire market was moving, how the entire, you know, sort of technology was moving and what the impact could be. There'll be winners, you know, there were winners and losers in that situation, like IBM's still around, but you probably have never heard of Burroughs Computers, the second largest computer company on earth when the PC came out, now gone right? Uh -huh. Because they weren't able to kind of retool themselves for the new world. Mm -hmm. And so they became like a dinosaur, right? In an environment where it, that had changed and they weren't really uh, evolved for survival. Um, so I think we're going to see that sort of level of disruption. But think about the benefits now to everybody, right? In the computer industry. What happened was that the total value that is being created in software and computers is, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than during the mainframe days. And it has spread out to everybody on earth practically, 
right? We all have cell phones now. We all have, uh, you know, personal computers. And even in, in you know, sub-Saharan Africa, people are carrying smartphones, that the value went up so high and the cost came down so low because of this revolution in computers. You're going to see the same thing happen in pharmaceuticals. And, and this is a great thing for everybody. And remember, you know, if this becomes, you know, it's a $1.5 trillion drug industry right now. If it becomes $20 trillion, isn't that good even for all of our competitors, for the whole pharma industry, right? There's more opportunity now, and it's, that opportunity is there because of the power of gene and cell therapy. We're at the beginning of it. We're at the MS-DOS stage, but we're working to make the <laughs> iPhone for your body. Well, I don't want to rabbit hole too much here, but yeah. uh, I'm sure that people are going to wonder, since this is top of mind for a lot of people, is, um, is AI, will that, will that or does that help amplify, will it help accelerate the work that you are doing already? So eventually, yes. Right now, you know, really just around the peripheral, you know, the periphery mm -hmm. of it. Uh, we use AI because we have a marketing department and it can help them to, you know, create materials, then they edit them. And, and you know, I remember I come out of the computer industry, so I, I personally believe that AI is a little bit overhyped. Uh, okay. And, you know, the fear factor is way overhyped. Uh, I think it's kind of a distraction. It does seem a little bubblicious at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I think that... Um, you know, ultimately all technologies merge, right? You know, one of the reasons that gene and cell therapy is moving so fast is because we already have the computer re revolution to rely on, right? I'm having a video call with you, which would have been really tough 20 years ago, right? <laughs> and, and now it's <laughs> easy. And so we can do business much more efficiently. Well, guess what? Computers also work back in our lab and they analyze our experiments and they read uh, data straight off of the equipment and we have robotics that help us to run experiments more accurately and faster and so we're just like a revolution on top of a revolution on top of mm -hmm. a revolution so you know we're already getting the benefit of a lot of uh, computer technology now big data and data mining and AI of course ultimately will unlock a lot of additional opportunities but there's so much low-hanging fruit right now mm -hmm. We don't need AI to help point us at something that's worth doing. So that's yeah. why we're not using it a lot in terms of determining our, uh, you know, what directions we'll go or what we'll, we'll develop. But one day, yes. Okay. Uh, you recently made an announcement about the efficacy and safety results of the AGT-103T Phase 1 clinical trial. I I'm curious... Um, for, by the way, for those of, of you who haven't seen the video yet, I'll put a card up here so you can um, uh, get a more info about the announcement. And I also have a link in the description that, that leads you straight to Jeff's um, live announcement that's now hosted on YouTube. But I, I really want to know, um, what was the energy like inside the walls of AGT? How did you feel? What was the reaction of everyone involved, like the scientists, researchers, even the participants in the trial? There was a lot of excitement in the room. Um, I think that um, this was a celebration of how far we've come. And I think that the, you know, the major milestones that happened recently were a, a almost, you know, like until the FDA gives the thumbs up, you don't know. But I would say that our phase one was about as close to perfect as you can get. 100% safety signal. We had zero serious adverse events. We had no adverse events that could be tracked back to the drug at all. And we got blood markers of efficacy that showed us theoretically that the, the cells were working. So, you know, the everybody was excited about that result. The next result was that we rolled into an analytic treatment interruption where we took people that had a small quantity of our supercells in their body, we took them off their antiretrovirals, and we saw tremendous level of efficacy, uh, you know, with respect to the the, the, the number of cells that were left in there uh, when we did that experiment. And uh, so, you know, this is scientifically very exciting and confidence building that we have line of sight on creating a reliable one and done functional cure for HIV, which is, I think, what everybody's dreaming about. Now, I always need to be very careful because people are listening to this and they're like, okay, great, I'll have it next year. No, <laughs> you won't have it next year. 
There's right. still a lot of work to be done. You know, a few years out would be a realistic sort of, okay. you know, aspiration to have in mind. That's sort of an mm -hmm. everything goes well uh, scenario. But everything in the past has been going well. The fact that we got that level of efficacy is mind-blowing, and I think it impressed a lot of scientists and a lot of um, uh, virologists and, and physicians that are really familiar with HIV. We know what we need to do next, and that is to roll into a phase two. So we were announcing that we're rolling into a phase two. We're going to propose that to the FDA this summer. And then finally, I think this is really, you know, signals our level of commitment and our level of belief in an HIV cure. And that is that we're spinning out Adimmune, um, you can see the logo right here, as a separate company focused only on HIV and specifically on HIV cure. Now, we think we can do even more than HIV cure. Uh, over time, we may be able to enable vaccines. So we may be able to find ways to prevent HIV spread in addition to curing people that have become uh, that, that have HIV in their body, that are living with HIV, right? Um, the, um, the, the plan is that we're going to have a group of scientists, uh, finance people, marketing, and we are going to raise separate money that will only go into HIV cure. That company will live and die based on its ability to do something for this community. Okay, and that is a level of commitment that this project deserves based on the data. And, and that, to me, was the most exciting part of the announcement. So, okay, so how do people feel about it? Well, um, the, uh, uh, you know, everybody came up to me afterwards. You know, there were people there that were living with HIV or knew that people that were living with HIV. And there is, you know, great reason for hope that we can put this in the rearview mirror, this whole uh, epidemic of HIV, uh, you know, we could start to uh, chip away at it and, and we could even dream of a day where we've wiped it off the earth like polio, right, or, or some of the other viruses that we have actually completely overcome. There's reason to have hope and even faith that this is along the continued trajectory of Adimmune. So they were very excited. The scientists obviously excited because they can read the data, and and the doctors came up and 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 they were you know. They, I was surprised at the level of energy, amongst our clinical collaborators, uh, for this because they treat these people every day, so they're keenly aware of, uh, of, how, good people would feel, to go from taking antiretrovirals for the rest of their life to never thinking about HIV again. And they know that's the goal of this, and they could also see, yeah, there's reason for hope that we can get there with this project. And so I was really impressed with the level of excitement, even from physicians. Because, you know, naturally they are, uh, you know, they apply medicine. So they're not mm -hmm. the types of people who generally are thinking ahead. Scientists are more theoretical. But I mm -hmm. think that we have finally, you know, sort of posted data that um, pretty much anybody can understand. And, you know, so long as people that are listening to this don't overestimate how quickly we can get it through the regulatory path and out through commercialization, mm -hmm. okay. Then, uh, you know, I think that they're getting the right message if they feel like, yeah, there's, there's a, a legitimate cause for celebration and excitement uh, and hope for the future. Yeah, and I thought you made a really good point, um, a really, really good point in your announcement, because a lot of folks, you know, they, they say, well, every, I feel like every year or, or several years, there's some kind of breakthrough announcement, and it kind of fizzles out, or it doesn't really go anywhere, and kind of a little bit cynical about the, the notion, but to say that you're at a point where you have institutional investor interest implies in of itself that there is, there's an exit point in the not too distant future for them as investors to be able to get return on their money. And so um, I, think, I think there's a little bit of like um, uncomfortability with the idea of money and profit when it comes to something like HIV. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that's, 
it's an enormous incentive and it's an en- enormous indicator of the progress that you you guys have really made that investors are looking at them going whoa there's a there's a viable product here yeah I think I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad that you sort of caught that uh, you know in the announcement yeah look Wall Street has only one interest in this and that is that they think it's at the point where it could make them money and that's not a negative thing remember that you know there is a place for capitalism and profitability to create a sustainable uh, you know sort of uh, uh, let's say a, a, a sustainable initiative right mm-hmm. because you cannot expect people to just keep donating their money to this forever on the hopes that it will turn into something at some point you're going to need big money to commercialize this across the planet to finish out all the regulatory part you know there's a phase two that we need to do there may be a phase three you know these things are not cheap and so to be able to engage that um, you know sort of that funding source could be greatly enabling and accelerating to the mission that is actually core to why we're doing this, right? It's the 38 million people that can um, be benefited uh, by having this thing out there. Well, when you get to that point, what it says is that this is understandable across that whole spectrum from people that just want it because they want to do some good in the world to people that, you know, want it because they can do well off of it. And if you have all those things working for you, uh, that's a big deal. So I thought it was a, you know, very important that we were actually getting a level of traction on Wall Street that we have never seen before. Uh, and it, what it said to me is that the data actually is understandable enough and far enough along that now they're willing to engage with it. And that is another sign of, of great progress. Yeah, I saw a number of viewers actually during the live chat asking if there's a way that they can get involved as an investor Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that's limited to accredited investors or is is that available to more people yeah the 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 current because we're a private company the current rules that we uh, raise money under say that we can only talk to people that are accredited investors and you can just look that up online if you want to figure out if you're an accredited investor Um, Mm -hmm. but we're not allowed to do solicitations and stuff like that because you know it's to protect the public Right. Yeah. You know, like people are out there all the time, you know, not in the drug industry, hopefully, but, you know, selling, uh, selling things um, and people mm-hmm. are putting their money into it. And they're in, in some cases not really educated well enough to make those decisions. And yet, you know, in a lot of industries um, looking at you, crypto. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right. And. <laughs> So in the drug industry, you know, we have the FDA and in the public uh, markets industry, we have the SEC and they're just basically trying to protect the public against snake oil salesmen. So, yeah, so there is that restriction. But, you know, someday we hope to uh, take Adimmune forward into the public market where then anybody could invest in it. You just Mm -hmm. call up your broker or get on, you know, your your website and you you should be able to buy shares anywhere in the world. Uh, But... You know, that's not something that we have made any specific announcements about. Okay. And I did have um, someone ask specifically, why the poppy for your logo? So the history of this was that we we didn't want to look like every other website out there, which is like all blue, like all drug companies are blue. And one of the colors that I love is that orange, that that sort of burnt orange of the California Mm -hmm. poppy. But it turned out the California poppy is actually red. So you'll see that our symbol ended up being sort of the red and the orange. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and it turned out that the California poppy means remembrance for those we've lost. And we thought that's perfectly appropriate. You know, like 40 million people have died from, you know, from the consequences of HIV or died with HIV, let's say. Many of them from AIDS in the early days. Now they're dying of old age, fortunately, but they lived their life with HIV. And Mm -hmm. and so we we just love the, the, you know, the callback to those folks. Um, And so it's sort of hope and remembrance. And I think that sort of describes where we are right now. Awesome. And 
You mentioned you'll be releasing your findings later this summer. Is there a date for that? So I don't have a date certain. We're writing an article right now, and what the, the um, article is about is the immunological data that we saw, so how the immune system was reacting in our participants' bodies um, and how it was affecting their viral load. And that is sort of the core data that came out of the treatment interruption study that really got all the scientists so excited and has me so excited is that, you know, we saw something completely uncharacteristic of taking people off their antiretrovirals. <laughs> Normally what you see is that their CD4 count goes down because mm -hmm. HIV, as it comes out of the viral reservoir, it attacks the T cells. So their CD4 mm -hmm. counts come down and they don't get any immune reaction, which is shown by the CD8s and the B cells. What we saw was the opposite. The, the CD4s survived, so they stayed stable, and the CD8s went up. Well, that is the way the body reacts when it's doing a, uh, an effective immune response against a virus. Well, uh, we also saw in the viral loads that there was an effect. Those two things together will be the, the core of this article, and I'm hoping that once we write it, uh, you know, we'll just find a journal uh, that's interested in, in printing it. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is not release too much so that there'll still be, you know, a journal will be able to release some really exciting mm. scientific information. And when would that happen? You know, I think once you figure third quarter of this year that, okay. you know, hopefully it'll be published. But we hope to finish that article, you know, by September. Finish and everyone writing. will have access to that to be able to read it. Oh, when we put it out there, we'll try to pay in the journal to get make it public. I don't mm -hmm. know how expensive okay. that is because depending on which journal you're in, you know, the, the, the cost may be really high. But you can see some of the articles that we put out before. What we've always done is we paid extra to the publisher so that anybody can see the article online. And there's a, you know, you look up American Gene Technologies in AGT 103-T. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you put the word Frontiers... In there, you'll see our article on the phase one, and um, there's an article in molecular therapy that anybody can see about our preclinical data. But these are, you know, sort of uh, milestone points along the way in the data. The preclinical data sort of hints at that we should see clinical data. Then the phase one shows a lot of really interesting stuff in the clinic, and our next article should be even more exciting where we reveal the you know, the underlying uh, immunological factors that are consistent with our theory that make us believe that we're on track for a cure. Well, that's so great that you're paying to, um, to when you can to be able to make that available to the public because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's so, it's uh, disappointing that the, the general public doesn't have access to that kind of data and that it's kind of closed off within the community. Yeah. That's often, a, you know, a big problem is being able to, um, create that bridge between medicine and science and community and therefore out of that hopefully create some sort of trust as well which i think is is vital well you know one of our one of the things that has been important to me is to try to be a um, both credible and trustworthy steward of a very important humanistic uh, endeavor right you know, like I came out of retirement because I thought gene and cell therapy could do a lot for my fellow human beings. And, um, you know, so I think that we're seeing a lot of evidence that that is the case, even at other companies. There's 27, uh, something like 27 or 30 approved gene and cell therapy products that are nothing short of miracles. They're curing cancers, blindness, crippling diseases. I mean, this is the power of gene and cell therapy, and now we have something that improves HIV T cells that may make people that are living with HIV permanently immune to HIV. They can't even get it back, right? Never need any other treatment. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is what it's all about. Now, of course, everybody out there is a stakeholder in this, right? Gene and cell therapy belongs to all of us. It was, it was revealed by nature and science. And sure, there's a lot of companies out there that are leveraging it to tr try to create sustainable models of getting solutions out to patients. And I think that this is going to bring great efficiencies, as I mentioned, to the pharmaceutical industry and great value to the public. So I think being transparent 
and embracing all the people that are part of this revolution, even as just consumers, is mm -hmm. very important. In the same way that I remember that when we were out there promoting the graphic user interface, you know, we were selling out into an industry that, and, and a public that didn't understand the value of it, didn't mm -hmm. understand that this was all about them, that Apple mm -hmm. had a better way of them interacting with computers that everybody would eventually adopt because, you know, there's inertia in the industry. Well, you know, it's the open minds of the public who look at it realistically and go, oh, wait a minute, there's something in this for me, so I will engage with it even though, you know, the, the, the uh, status quo or the common wisdom is, oh, you know, this, this isn't the way that drugs are done or, you know, uh, or it'll never sell. I mean, I hear this stuff all the time. Uh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, there's going to be, it's normal skepticism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, disruption yeah. is always met by a lot of skepticism, and, um, and, and I think that's just natural. You know, people love progress, but they're resistant to change because mm. change disrupts their lives. Progress sounds great, but it comes with change, right? And, and so it's hard sometimes uh, to believe in something new. And so we have to prove it. But, and this is why I try not to get too far ahead of my skis with everybody that I'm talking to and overpromise, because yeah. I think we are proving it. I think the industry's proving it. I think that AGT and Adamune are proving it. And I think that the public's gradually, you know, coming over to this. And I think that that will create that, you know, massive revolution uh, in healthcare uh, that I've been dreaming about. And so, yes, of course, you know, going back to your original comment is that we just try to be as transparent as we can be without hurting the mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and t you mentioned the word skepticism, and that's, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth on what I was going to ask you about folks who in general are potentially skeptical of private companies or government organizations, uh, when it comes to gene therapy, vaccines, mm -hmm. other other newer medical treatments, what what message would you want to convey to those folks? Well, so what I would say is when you look at Adimmune, just remember that nobody can benefit from Adimmune, including you know the capitalists, the investors, the VCs, Wall Street, our employees, or whatever, unless we do something, because we got nothing, right? We're not selling a drug. Like Gilead can keep selling their drug forever, fifteen mm. billion dollars or sixteen billion dollars a year of you know ninety nine percent gross margins, <laughs> they got no complaints. <laughs> if the cure never comes along, it, you know it it isn't going to hurt Gilead, right? But for us, it's a whole different story. Like everybody's incentives are aligned in the ad immune mission, and so I think that's something that you know doesn't have a lot of uh, of mystery to it right every again the transparency you know is is conducive to understanding that when you lift up the covers you see exactly what you expect to see here a bunch of people who are really hopeful that we can get all the way to a cure and if we do yeah you know the employees will do well the investors will do well but it's like do we really care about that if they're giving value to the patients no what we do care about is that they can't make a boatload of money without giving value to the patients. And that's why you can look at us and go, we're your partners in something you care about. And, and yeah. you're our partners in something we care about. That's why we, you know, again, it goes back to engagement. It's like, we're all in this together. We can't win if mm -hmm. you don't win. If you're out there listening and, and you're a person living with HIV, that, you know, we can't win as a company even as a for-profit company, if we can convert into that, even as a public company, unless we solve a problem for that group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always try to stress to people through my videos when I talk that incentives are so important and they're underappreciated. Um, so often we take the negative perspective and that's to... Um, push more enforcement, laws, regulations, control, uh, restrictions, when an incentive could could solve all of the, those things for you yeah. and encourage growth and creativity. 
So, yeah. Absolutely. You, you know, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, uh, you know, that's been my challenge in my 3D chess game that I've had to play on, you know, one of the six boards that I have to play it. Yeah. As CEO of this company is to figure out how to make sure that all the people I engage with, that we do have the same incentives so everybody's working in the same direction. Because I think that there's a huge amount of desire for this. I think there's a huge amount of technology that suggests it's possible. I think we have a huge amount of momentum. So if we keep bringing people in who want to see that endpoint, this thing will be like a snowball rolling downhill. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that will maximize the chances of getting there. And, yeah, incentives is what it's all about. Now, you know, I think sometimes you do need regulation as well because, yeah. you know, like you said, you, you mentioned this earlier, you keep seeing that, oh, somebody cured a mouse in, in Jerusalem, right? You know, like they eradicated all the HIV in their body. And, and and I get this from all my investors, like, oh, they're ahead of you. They already wiped out, you know, they sterilized a mouse, you know, of HIV. And I'm like, you know, the H in HIV stands for human, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't move around a mouse's body the same way it moves around a human's body. It's a completely different problem. So, yes, you will get people that can find ways to uh, create excitement and create profits off of mm -hmm. these things and that's why sometimes regulation is important and also you know honest scientific evaluation and figuring out yeah. who can you trust amongst the scientific community to tell you what's real and what's not real and what's the real distance between what you just heard and something that would do something for you or for yeah. somebody that you love right that's the the key there so sometimes I'm like you know the FDA everybody complains about them but I'm like they are really important in terms of making sure that over-enthusiastic, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be that somebody meant to do something dangerous or didn't care. Yeah. No, it could just be that it's so easy to fall in love with your baby. It's so nice to have a second set of eyes yeah. that will sit down and look at the safety aspect of this and revalidate what you believe that, yes, it is worth doing this experiment, it is safe to put this into people. And so, you know, but that's a regulation and a lot of people complain about it, but, uh, you know, and I'm sure I think I can be trusted, right? But so does everybody, that's the whole point, you know? <laughs> it's like yeah. that second set of eyes is really valuable to make sure that people don't accidentally uh, get sold or treated with something mm -hmm. that could be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a balance, like you said, and yeah. um, and it doesn't mean that anyone has ill intent either. Like you said, I agree one hundred percent. I think uh, most people are good, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, even though I've seen a lot of bad in the world, I really mm -hmm. believe that if you know good people come together, uh, and will be, you know, citizens of everything, right? Think things through, fact find, use their logic, use their gut that um, the world will continue to move in good directions. And I, I certainly think that's true about this industry. And, and I, I just think that there's a good, you know, really bright future ahead. Well, and I think that speaks to your character. I had a, um, I had a conversation ac actually a, a few days ago with a journalist. I won't, <laughs> I won't say his name. I'm not going to out you. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and we had, we just had this private conversation and we, we ended up talking about you and, and, AGT and we're just like gosh Jeff seems like just exudes like heart and and charisma and just humility and someone who's really authentic and genuine and truly cares and it's like we were both just like wowed by that and I'm like and I'm just waiting for him to like unzip his a fake persona and then this the evil you know what your stereotype that what you think of comes out but it's like i don't believe that that's there and so um we, we just kind of had a laugh about that but I, that's the impression that i get from a lot of folks when wow. they um, hear you speak or see you is just how um genuine you you seem to be well thank you so much and thank you to the mystery person you were talking to also <laughs> look I, i'm trying my best uh, to be a good person. But on top of that, I feel like I've been given this unbelievable opportunity by just being the right person in the right place at the right time, you know. Think about, like, 
I just happened to meet Roscoe Brady while, you know, at the point that he was retiring and, and they were going to throw away all this great research and I recognized the value of it. And then the, the idea that I could even survive over this time period is sort of a miracle. So, you know, I know I'm working hard, but I also feel really lucky to be working on something that I think is so personally fulfilling to me that, you know, that um, what is the you know, what is the value of a life, right? Because I have to think about, like, what's the value of my life? Why, why, you know, what, what is my purpose, right? And, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm so glad that you s see, you know, sort of my desire to be, do good and, and my desire to just be transparent and honest and to shepherd this mission uh, in, in a good way to, to, to try to get it there, right? But also on the other side, you know, I'm just feeling lucky to have this opportunity to do what I'm doing uh, because, you know, this was not a given. You don't just, you know, one day wake up and go, oh, you know, let's cure HIV and you get on something like this. No, you have to see a brass ring and grab it and then you, you know, have to see a whole series of brass rings after that and, and grab them and, you know, sure, we make our own luck because the, you know, luck favors the mind that is prepared. In other words, like, if you work hard and you're smart, you're going to be more likely to recognize opportunities and grab them. But the opportunities ha still have to be there. So I don't care how smart or how hard I work. Some part of this is just, you know, meeting the right people at the right time and engaging the right people at the right time. And, and I think that the best way to engage other humans is to just, you know, be open and honest and forthright with them. Talk about what it is that you want to do and what you see, and and the people that 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 fall in love with that will join you. <laughs> and that's ex that's the history of AGT. So anyway, long tome on on that for just a, something that you said that was very nice. Uh, so well, thank. Well, no, uh, I. I, w I have a lot more questions, but in the interest of time, and I know we're coming up on on the hour, I don't want to dive too deeply, but you seem like a font of wisdom, and I would love maybe another time to kind of uh, explore who Jeff Galvin is and, and where you come from and, and, and all of that, if you're open to it. Absolutely. Uh, anytime. Uh, I got to say, you know, uh, this is another really enjoyable conversation uh, that I've had with you. The, when you came on the HIV Cure Chronicles, it was at the very beginning of that show, and that's turned out to be amazing. The people that mm -hmm. I have had a chance to meet through that, you were the first example of that. Uh, well, actually, right before you was Marcus Conan. Of course, I knew him really well already. He's amazing. But then you came on, and I was like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just saw so many cool themes in that. And it really does boil down to us as, as people, right? And, you know, we're the, you know, uh, I got to say that I just, I love the human race. I love humans. I think they're <laughs> amazing. Sometimes they can be dangerous, right? You know, not every human being is good or has your interests in mind or is in a situation where they can even be, you know, benevolent or positive right. or whatever. So sometimes, you yeah. know, people are just in bad situations and you can't count on them. But... Yeah, what makes us tick is fascinating to me, and you know, I, I, I have met people like you, who I think have just had amazing lives with incredible lessons and and like you said, wisdom that comes out of that, that we can share. And yeah, I'm always up for a conversation about that sort of stuff. It's the the awesome. you know, besides curing HIV, that's one of my biggest hobbies is people. Okay, awesome. Yeah, love it. Okay, I, I do have a, a couple questions from viewers. Uh, let's see. Well, here's one. Have you and the team looked at inflammatory markers to determine how significant was the residual inflammation post-ATI? So we didn't in this study, but we're planning to in the next. Inflammation markers can be hard to measure, but we're looking for an assay that would be appropriate in the phase two. And think about the phase two as sort of like an expanded phase one, because we're not really changing the drug. We're going to change the administration protocol. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking for is data, like every angle that we think is worthwhile on this, and inflammatory markers are one of them. 
Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked, with a potential cure such as AGT103T, if there was one HIV reservoir missed, does that mean the reinfection cycle starts again? That's the beauty of our approach. It's not a sterilizing cure. We're not counting on wiping out the entire viral reservoir, even though we think it's possible. What we're doing is we're creating an immune system that can fight the virus in the same way that you fight all chronic viral infections. Your body's full of them. The difference is, is that the, your chronic viral infections of CMV, Epstein-Barr, human papillomavirus, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, you know, herpes, you have so many things in your body that your immune system just stays on top of and you have zero consequences for life. You're not taking drugs every day for herpes, are you? Of course not, right? Although almost all of us have herpes. Mm -hmm. Gee, how does that work? Well, your immune system can handle it, right? And but herpes is unusual because it doesn't go into the bloodstream like a lot of viruses do. But in this case, HIV presents in the bloodstream. So it's in a perfect place for your T cells to handle it before it turns into a symptom. And the symptom of, of HIV takes so long to get. It could take five years, right? Yeah. So your immune mm -hmm. system has tons of time to react. Okay, so uh, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, in the way that we're approaching it, it doesn't matter if you still have a small amount of virus in your body or viral reservoir. If it starts creating virons, the T cells should see it, they should react, and they should even attack that cell that's creating the virons and kill it. So that's what the CD8 cells do. Now, there are a lot of other ones out there where they are saying they're going to do a sterilizing cure, and, and I have my doubts about that because what, you're, what the person who, who wrote this question is pointing out is that it is true that if there's, some, there's not anything left in your body that will continue to fight it, right, that it only takes one latently infected cell in your body to reconstitute the entire HIV inf uh, mm -hmm. infection. Okay, so I think it's unrealistic to believe that we can cut out every copy of HIV using, you know, some sort of, um, uh, you know, CRISPR technology or something like that. I think we could reduce the amount of antiretrovirals by reducing the viral reservoir in any way that, you know, we can find to do that. Uh, that's yeah. another measurement that we plan to take in the, in the phase two. We're going to see if we can find a reliable marker for viral reservoir so we can see how are we, oh, wow. uh, you know, changing the viral reservoir with our treatment. There's every reason to believe that we are, uh, you know, reducing it. Theoretically, mm. we should be reducing it. But, you know, in, in science, you don't, you don't know it till you show it. You got to demonstrate right. it in a repeatable assay that somebody else can run <laughs> before you can claim it. So that's something that I'm very curious about, and we're we're looking for an assay that will cover that as well. But no, viral reservoir is something that we think mm, you can live with, so long as it has zero consequences. And zero consequences means that the virus never gets high enough for you to infect anybody. You cannot develop AIDS. And you can't even recontract it because what's a little more HIV in your body if you you, know, you already have the system for fighting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is the concern of chronic inflammation, things like that going on in the body with reservoirs. But even if we have a decrease in reservoir, that would should that, would take that. that should theoretically reduce chronic inflammation. And yeah. yes, what you're telling me is something that I have also heard from scientists is that. The consequences of the current treatment regimes, or regimens, sorry, um, are that you have the, the toxicities of the chemotherapeutic, right? So there's going to be long-term exposure even to these mild chemical agents can have yeah. liver, kidney, heart consequences, even extra cancers. And we, don't, can't, we have a hard time separating that from the chronic inflammation of the virus itself, right? So, yes, you do have viral reservoir. <laughs> they are producing virons. They're not mm -hmm. infecting new cells, but reducing that viral reservoir could have a, a very beneficial effect on, on uh, chronic inflammation, which could uh, not only give people sort of better quality of life, if we could get rid of that, uh, but it could also, um, you know, make the entire long-term consequences of, of treating HIV much less less um, profound, right? 
you could reduce those long-term side effects of the treatment regimes. Regimen, Absolutely. sorry. Yeah. There you go. You caught me. I'm not. That's how you can tell I'm not actually a physician. I just play one on TV. <laughs> Every once in a while, I drop the wrong word. <laughs> well, I defer to you still, regardless. <laughs> um, is there anything, any last comment or something you'd like to share or say before we wrap up? No, just look. Thank you and everybody in your audience for your interest in uh, AGT and Adimmune and, you know, please keep an eye on us. Uh, you know, um, if you see something good, talk about it. If you have questions, put them up on the website. You know, we, we answer questions. We have a knowledge base. We're, we're really trying to engage with, with everybody that cares about, you know, what we care about. And what we care about is trying to find a, a better solution for HIV than currently exists. And hopefully that is a functional cure, one and done, never think about HIV again. Um, and, you know, so we will continue to swing for the fences. And, and, and believe it or not, just the public knowing about this is enabling and accelerating to that mission. And where can folks go if they want to follow you and or AGT at Immune's work? Well, uh, first thing is go to adimmune.com and that is specifically now for HIV. Uh, go to a, you know, americangene.com uh, if you're interested in some, uh, some of the other aspects of the platform. Um, and then, of course, I'm on LinkedIn and um, uh, we're on Facebook and you can find us all over the place. Twitter. Yeah, just go in on our website, you know, you'll find all of the connections to social media. And I really do recommend that people hook up, I would say, particularly with our Facebook group. That seemed to be really mm. active. Uh, you know, it, it seems sort of old school to be on Facebook. Like, why isn't it our TikTok that's blowing up? I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if we have TikTok. Um, but... <laughs> You know, the point is, is like connect any place that's convenient for you. And we try to just put out a constant stream of information out there. You're going to find that sometimes it's repetitive because things happen slowly. But people sometimes, you know, miss something that we put up there. So we put it up multiple times. So don't, mm -hmm. you know, don't feel bad if you see something more than once. Uh, but, you know, watch the, the steady forward march of this. Uh, and just go to our websites and you can find all our social media links and, and maybe we can supply them even in the, the comments of this uh, video. And Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to have all those links, including the Facebook group, in the description box below the video for you guys. Cool. Everyone at home, please comment below your thoughts, questions. Um, I'm happy to do follow-up as well. And do let me know if you'd love to have Jeff Galvin on. Um, on the channel at some point to continue this conversation, which I'm sure that's going to happen regardless. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Jeff, thank you so much for being so gracious and, and with your time and, and energy. Um, everyone, be sure to like this video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. It's happening a lot more frequently lately. lately. So be ready um, and share this video with as, as many people as you can who might find this valuable. Until next time, cheers.